Defend the sacred, honor the earth, water is life. All these powerful phrases are the cries of indigenous rights movements that are occurring in the present moment, based on a history of expansionism, removal, and oppression. For centuries, Native Americans have been subjected to the practice of othering, which is defined as viewing people as different and separated, therefore degrading and diminishing the worth of the lives, traditions, and belongings of those othered. The othering of people based upon race, ethnicity, culture, or other factors is often considered an issue of the past. Contrarily, various forms of othering are still present in the world today, and the social, economic, and public health implications of othering are prevalent as well. The effects of othering are felt both presently and locally, and are made manifest in issues of environmental justice. Environmental justice is defined as the inherent right of all to live in a healthy environment. Environmental justice issues are felt particularly strongly among communities who have been historically subjected to othering, including many Native American groups. Amy West is a member of the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Indians and resides within the Kuala Boundary, a federally recognized territory of the Cherokee located near the border with Tennessee and Western North Carolina. As a recent recipient of her degree in education and the current Miss Cherokee, she's knowledgeable and well-equipped to shed light on some of the many issues that othering has caused among the Cherokee community. One such environmental justice issue is a lack of access to adequate and healthy foods faced by many individuals within the koala boundary. The resulting food desert poses increased occurrences of health problems for many Cherokee members as well. On the boundary, we have one grocery store and that's food line, and it's a disaster 90% of the time. We don't have those healthy options that we can just run down and grab. The negative impacts of a lack of readily accessible and nourishing foods are felt by Amy and her family. Most of my family members are at least diabetic. Um, heart problems run in our family as well. From an environmental justice perspective, members of the Kuala Boundary are violated in their inherent right to live, prosper, and enjoy the advantages of a healthy environment. Their access to abundant and beneficial food sources is limited, directly as a result of their confinement to this boundary because of historical marginalization. Aside from this, the social implications of othering are especially present today, even in social services that promise adequate education. Speaking on this issue, Amy stated, It's discrimination. That's just simply how I would put it. But as well as the state curriculum that our children are held to is, you know, bare. It's the bare minimum on the Cherokee history. Due to a lack of thorough education on Cherokee history, the existence of Native Cherokee Indians today is lacking or nearly entirely forgotten. A fact made apparent in the near absence of literature relating to the status of Cherokee populations in the world today. When the removal of Cherokee populations is discussed in history, it demonstrates the clear effects of othering imposed on Native Americans. There were a lot of things done to basically kill the Indian and save the man. They would put normal clothing on them to kill the Indian to save the man. The history of othering is made abundantly clear in Amy's life and those around her doesn't look like the world was built for us um just be or that they treated us with that same equality saying oh the world's built for you and it's built for me too obviously it was not in their eyes amy puts into sharp focus the devastating reality that cherokee indians have been ostracized in history and that the results of this exclusion are evident today but what is the basis of this phenomenon how did this treatment become a justifiable and common occurrence Frankly, the issues of American Indian displacement stem directly from the earliest ideas of European expansionism. British, Dutch, French, and Swedish traders began arriving in the land that is now the U.S. in the 14th and 15th centuries. Initially, the exchange of goods was mutually beneficial, and the Europeans understood the importance of having a good working relationship with the natives. However, tensions began to arise when the Europeans sought to permanently extend their presence in this new foreign market. The natives were at a distinct disadvantage in these expansionist dealings. They had no system of land ownership in the European sense. There were misunderstandings about the concept of permanently selling land and excluding its previous owners thereafter. Natives assumed that they were only granting the Europeans the right to use the land and that they received gifts in appreciation thereof and as a token of friendship. 
Alongside this loss of native lands came the loss of native lives, as old world diseases ravaged Indian populations and confrontations with settlers increased. The natives vacated what was left of their lands in an attempt to move out of the Europeans' path of destruction. Relocating also enabled native nations the chance to escape the European sphere of influence and preserve their traditional ways of life. This trend of relocation in order to preserve native Indian culture in the wake of European expansionist invasion continued for centuries as seen in the traumatic litany of abuses of the Trail of Tears. Following the passage of the Indian Removal Act in 1830, thousands of Native Americans were removed from their homes and forced to reside on designated lands west of the Mississippi River. Notably and tragically, in 1838, nearly 15,000 members of the Cherokee Nation located in Georgia became the largest number of Indians ever moved in a limited time along the trail. Discriminatory practices were not isolated in the actions of expansionists and government leaders, as some of the most influential environmental writers of the 19th century wrote using the same thoughts. One such writer was Henry David Thoreau. In his work, Walking, he portrayed indigenous populations in the context of primitivity, which served to justify their displacement. He states, Winds blew the Indian's cornfield into the meadow and pointed out the way which he had not the skill to follow, highlighting their primitivity and incompetence. He also criticizes the lifestyle of indigenous populations in his work Walden, where he explains that by merely paying tax, the poor civilized man secures an abode, which is a palace compared with the savages. Thoreau presents a dichotomy between living situations of white Western inhabitants and Indians through the use of terms such as civilized and savage. The use of these terms solidifies the associations of primitivity with indigenous groups and is used to ostracize these individuals as a justification for westward expansion by white colonists. He fundamentally believed and expressed in his journal, the history of the white man is a history of improvement that of the red man, a history of fixed habitats of stagnation. The effects of portraying indigenous groups as primitive and savage are seen through recent history and even reflected today as we can observe the experiences of marginalized groups such as Cherokee Indians. Today, the oppression of Native Americans is studied more in a historical context through lenses of violence, cultural imperialism, exploitation, marginalization, and powerlessness. As a society, it is essential for everyone to take the next step in acknowledging and unraveling the horrors of the past for a more equitable and sustainable future. And Amy offers a place to start. People should be taking that extra step to learn as well as us educate.